2 Peter chapter one. 2 Peter uh, chapter one. I wanna talk to you this morning um, and, and, and for the next couple moments out of this letter, and really the title of our time together is this, Confirming God's Choice of You. Confirming God's Choice of You. How many know that God has called you? How many know God has chosen you? And as we get into the letter of Peter this morning, we'll find out that God is actually calling us to confirm the fact that he's chosen us. So stand with me as we turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. All right, we're going to be in the Bible quite a bit. Surprise. That was a joke? All right. You ready? All right, if you don't have a Bible with you, you'll see it up on the screen behind me. It says this, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. How many know you can be both? Yes. Hello? You, you can be servant and apostle. You, you, can be, you can be anointed and still serve. You can be both. It's not one or the other. It's, it's both. Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, meaning he's writing to believers, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. God is, Jesus is not just your Savior. He is your God. He's not just in the business of saving. He's also in the business of being Lord. Yes. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power, watch this, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness, which means perseverance or patience. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. The translations say you will never stumble. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and do what only you can do. Be our teacher. Be our helper. Be the one that leads us and guides us into all truth concerning Jesus. Let Jesus be exalted. Infuse our thoughts and our imagination with your reality so that we may see you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that we avail ourselves to you. We know, Lord, in this room and even those watching online represent many different journeys. But we are here under the same God. We are here under the name of Jesus. And it is our desire that you be glorified and magnified and that you transform us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Before you're seated, would you welcome somebody around you? Say hi to somebody. Welcome them. Tell them 
Tell them they look good and don't lie. Hey, listen, if you're watching online, comment. Let us know you're joined, you've joined us today. Just getting a good look at you guys. It looks so good. Like two people believe that. The rest of you look confused. Um, are you like me at the beginning of the year? Do you get overwhelmed uh, with the amount of information uh, that is thrown at you in regards to what you ought to be doing this year? <laughs> the goals you ought to have, the, the man or the woman that you're called to become? Are you, are you like me? Are you overwhelmed with the plethora of information thrown at you. Hey, this is who you're supposed to become. These are the things you should focus on for this year. If you want to be successful, if you want to uh, move ahead in your career, if you want to move ahead in life, if you want to win in 2024, these are the things you ought to focus on. And, and you look at yourself and you go, man, I haven't even thought of half of those things. Uh, how am I going to get through this year? One of the things that I think is a challenge as all these things get thrown at us is deciphering what's really important. Hello? When all, these, and all this information gets thrown at you and people are, told, people are telling you, hey, uh, this is the amount of calories you ought to intake. <laughs> Hello? You go on social media, they tell you don't eat this, so you stop eating that, and then you eat something else and they tell you don't eat that either. There's so much information being thrown at us. It's hard to decipher, hey, what's really important? Have you asked yourself for this year, hey, what's really important? What am I going to focus on that's actually going to matter? Peter, as he writes this letter, is at the end of his life. He's actually going to die soon. Uh, how many know when you get older, you get close to death, you stop caring about the opinions of people? <laughs> And you're just going to tell it the way God told you to say it. Amen? And so Peter, at the end of his life, is writing to a Christian audience. And he's saying, hey, in the midst of the information that you are receiving, because they, they are, are living in the Roman Greco uh, era. And, and this era, it, by the way, is kind of like ours. They are booming. They are advanced for where they're at. And so no doubt they are being told, hey, here's what you ought to do. Here's who you ought to be like. Conform to this reality. Conform to that reality. And so Peter, at the end of his life, is writing to his audience to tell them, hey, let me tell you what's really important. That you confirm God's choice of you. That you know without a shadow of doubt that you are 100% confident. You have total assurance in this one fact. God has called you and God has chosen you. What if this year could be the year where you are unshaken in your belief that there is a God who has called you and chosen you? Amen. What if that's what's most important? And so Peter is writing to this audience, and really he's writing for multiple reasons at the end of his life. He wants them to grow in their faith. He wants them to live righteous life and righteous lives, and he wants them to avoid falling in the trap of false teachings. And one of the ways he says to avoid the trap of false teaching is making sure that there is transformation in your life. Because once you've experienced the transformational power of God in your life, people cannot sway you. Hello? No one can convince you that God is not real, that God is not powerful, that God is not still moving and active, that he is the same God who, who raised Jesus from the dead. And he's still transforming lives today. And so he says, we're going to be in the Bible this morning a little bit. Is that okay? Do a little bit of a Bible study, and we'll give, get to some thoughts even as we, as we get to the conclusion, and then we'll worship some more. He says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Are you like me? When you read that, you go, really? All things? 
God has given you everything you need to live a life that pleases him. Whoa. Because a lot of times I wake up feeling like I'm not equipped. A lot of times I wake up feeling inadequate, and yet the Bible informs us that God has given you everything you need to live the life that he has called you to live. In other words, if God has not equipped you for it, he won't call you to it. So here's the process. In verse 3 to 4, here's the process. Let me just highlight this for you. It's... He, he says, hey, listen, I want you to understand that everything starts with the power of God. His divine power grants us all things. Now watch this, that pertain to life and godliness, and so his power brings us to knowledge of him. So what's, what's the point of the power of God? To bring you into knowledge of Jesus. Hello? A lot of people want power, but they don't actually have knowledge of Jesus. And so if you want power, the gateway to power is a genuine and authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. So the power of God enables us to know him. He calls us to his own glory and his excellence. Jesus shares his glory with you. Whoa. God does not suffer with low self-esteem. God shares his glory with you. God is not scared that you're going to outshine him. But God shares his glory with you so that you can represent him in this world. So so the power of God enables us to know him, calls us to his glory, his excellence. That brings us to great and precious promises that help us to escape from the desires of this world. And we share in the divine nature of God So what's the point of his power? To ultimately lead us into participating with his very own nature. God wants you to look like him. If you read Romans 8, Paul will tell us, this is why you have been predestined. This is why you have been justified. This is why you have been called. This is why you have been sanctified. This is why you will ultimately one day be glorified to conform into the image of Jesus Christ. How are we doing so far? I'm getting some some feedback. I don't know if we could fix that. Um, And so that's the point of the power of God to share in the divine nature and in his godliness. And then he says, he says this, by the way, He's given you everything in order to be like him. I want you to wrap your head around that for a moment. That means whenever we are not like Jesus, it's because we chose us, we chose to not be like Jesus. It's not because we were lacking something. It's not because we were missing something. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The days we don't want to be like Jesus is simply because we don't want to be like Jesus. You are in your relationship with God, wherever you are, you're there because that's where you want to be. Am I talking to anybody today? Where you are in your relationship with God, you're there because that's exactly where you want to be. So if you feel distant from God, that's because you chose to be. Hello? Hello? For God is not a man that he should lie. If you draw close to him, he will draw close to you. And so wherever you are, it's because you want to be there. And so if you neglect who God is, it's because you're a neglectful individual. And Peter is not pulling any punches, and neither am I at 10.59 a.m. And so... And so he says he's given you everything. He's given you everything. Verse 5, verse 5, verse 5. He says, for this very reason, make every effort. Make every effort. Now, let's go into this. For what reason? That's the question we have to ask. If he's saying for this very reason, the question is, for what reason? 
Well, that's connected to verses four, three, and four because of everything in verses three and four. What happened in verses three and four? God in his power gave us everything we need to live a life of godliness. He caused us to know him. He called us to his glory and his excellence. He's given us precious and great promises so that we can become partakers of his nature and escape from the corrupt desires of this world. For that reason, make every effort In other words, because God has acted, now you act. Because God has done his work, now you do your work. Now, 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 let me be careful, let me be careful, let me be careful, lean in for a moment, because we are so guilty of reversing this. See, in theory, we know this, God has acted, so now we must act, but in practice, we live lives where we act, and then we say, God, now you act. And in practice, we live lives as if we are the great initiators of this relationship. And I'm here to tell you, we are not. For there is only one great initiator, the author and the finisher of our faith, and his name is Jesus. And so we cannot reverse the two. That is anti-gospel to say, because I have worked, now God must work. You cannot earn his favor, church. Stop listening to the men and the women who have platforms and are holding mics that are telling you, here are five ways to earn God's favor for this year. Get out, run away, don't listen to those people. They don't know what they're talking about. You don't earn God's favor, you find it. You find it. How do you find it? You just stumble into it living day to day. You you just stumble into it. The Bible says that Noah found favor with God. How? He was just living. And God just decided, because God is a gracious and merciful God. And God says, I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. It is my choosing, not your earning. Wow. How are we doing so far? For this very reason, make every Effort. Now, when we talk about effort, we get, a little, we get a little funny sometimes because immediately in your mind goes, what about grace? And I love what Dallas Willard says. Dallas Willard says this. He says, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Isn't that good? Let me say that again. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. And so you don't neglect grace simply because you choose to put in effort and you work out your faith with fear and trembling. You neglect grace when you refuse to be empowered by it to live a life of effort. Grace empowers us so that we can put in the effort that we need to supplement our faith. How are we doing? All right, ready for a crazy thought? So you ever, you know, you read the Gospels and you see Jesus heal so many people. How many know Jesus is our healer? If you need healing, Jesus can heal you. He's still healing people today just as he was 2,000 years ago. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging in his nature. And so you can count on him to heal you. You don't even have to do anything crazy. You don't have to bring up money here. You don't have to do uh, a dance. You don't have to jump on your left toe and in your right toe and then spin around and do something crazy for God. No, no, no. You can simply say, God, I received the healing you have for me. So Jesus heals in the gospels. He heals people who are blind. He heals uh, women with issues of blood. He heals the lame who cannot walk, and now they can walk. He does all sorts of healings. You know, you can scour through the Gospels of the New Testament, and you will never find once Jesus healing someone from lying. Jesus has never healed a liar. He's never healed anyone from lying in the entirety of the New Testament. You want to know why that is? Because God is not responsible for your character. You are. Oh, I wish you heard what I just said. God is not responsible for your character. You are. And so if your character is not being developed, it is not God's fault. It's yours. Surprise. 
It is your fault. Character is formed on the day-to-day journey of following Jesus. That's where character is formed. If you study any character in the Bible, any character, you go Moses, you go Abraham, you go Joseph, you go Daniel, you go David, any character, you go Peter, you go Paul, any character in the Bible, you will see their first encounter with God does not transform their character, it transforms their life, and that's different. Because meeting God, encountering God, sets my life on a trajectory now that is towards him and that is focused on seeking first the kingdom of God. But my character is developed in the day to day. And so if you study the life of Joseph, you will notice that his character is developed through a journey. You study the life of Moses, his character is developed through a journey. And so your character, church, is not God's responsibility. It's yours. And the only reason you're not growing in it is because you're neglecting it. Now watch what he says. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Now watch this. God has given you a new life, but he will not live that new life for you. God has given you a new life in Christ, but he won't live that life for you. You can pray all you want. Unless your two feet go the places God has called you to, nothing's happening. How are we doing? Because I'm having fun. You look a little intense, just relax. (laughs) He says, supplement your faith, supplement your faith. You know what that tells me? Your faith is not enough. You're like, Pastor Moses, what are you saying? I'm just reading the Bible. He says, supplement your faith. If anything requires supplement, it means it's not enough. Hello? Oh, you don't believe me. Let's read it again together. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Oh, it's in the Bible. That means your faith is not enough. The reason you even take dietary supplements is because what you're eating is not giving you the nutrition that you need. And so you have to supplement it because you're not getting the vitamins and the minerals that you should be getting from your food. And so you have to take dietary supplements. Are you following me? And so Peter is saying, just like that, your faith needs to be supplemented. James says it this way. Faith without works is... Ah... Faith without works is dead. Faith has to be supplemented with works. Faith has to be supplemented with character. Now, Peter later on goes to say this in 1 Peter 1.23. He says, he says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Meaning, meaning, salvation comes into your life in seed form. Hello? The moment you get saved, the next day you're going to wake up feeling exactly the same. I know. You're gonna you're gonna feel exactly the same. If you're over if you're overweight before you follow Jesus, you're still gonna be overweight the next morning after following Jesus. Hello? If you're bald before following Jesus, you're still gonna be bald the next morning you wake up after following Jesus. Salvation comes to you in seed form, meaning it must be nurtured. It must be matured. It must grow. And we know this, that if we understand what the Bible talks about in terms of our growth and the trajectory of, of us becoming like Jesus, we know that we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And so God has saved us, But in the middle of that, we're being saved until ultimately we will be saved totally. How many know that you are a spiritual being who has a soul that lives in a body? You're a spiritual being, meaning your spirit, your essence is spirit. You have a soul, your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. That's the part of your, that's that's your personality. And then you live in a body. How many know your body didn't get saved? Some of you really know your body didn't get saved. 
That was a joke, we can laugh. Oh my gosh, there is tension in the room. Your, your body doesn't get saved. What, parts, what part of you gets saved? Your spirit. Before Jesus actually comes into your life, before the Holy Spirit actually enters you, the Bible says that our spirit is actually dead. So our spirit comes alive. And then our soul goes through a transforming process. The part of you that is being developed, that's your soul. Ultimately, one day you're going to have a new body. And so he goes through the list. He talks about faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, perseverance, uh, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Now, before we go through the list, let me say this. Because in, in, in North America, you and I, we're so linear in our thinking. We think one, two, three, four, five. We think step A, step B, step C. But the writers of the Bible, the writers of the New Testament, and even the Old Testament are not linear thinkers. They think very organically. They think in blocks. They think in webs. Everything is connected and dependent on the other. And so what you and I do when we see a list, and we do this even in Galatians 5, you know the gifts of the Holy or uh, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience. What do we do? We focus on one. We go, this year I'm going to work on love because I don't need self-control. And I don't need kindness. So I'm just going to focus on this one thing. And then when we feel like we got a handle on that, we switch to another one. But that's not, that's not how he intended it. He didn't intend it to be sequential and linear to go, okay, this is the first thing, this is the second thing. Because if that was the case, why did he leave love as the last thing? If it was linear, then love, Paul, Peter is saying, is the least of our priorities. And how many know it's not? And so it's not linear, it's all connected, it's organic. And so before we get into this list, we have to understand that one depends on the other. So if you have faith, but you don't have virtue, your faith is dead. If you have faith, but you don't have steadfastness, your faith is conditional. If you have knowledge, but you don't have self-control, then that means you don't actually believe in what you know. If you have godliness, but no love, then is it really godliness? Because godliness is God-likeness, and God is love. So you can't have godliness without love. Each are connected and dependent on one another. Do you see that? So let's just run through the list really quickly. He says faith, faith into virtue. Virtue is moral excellence. Virtue into knowledge. Now, this knowledge is personal knowledge. He is living in a day and space, much like ours, where knowing things is very, it's in. Knowledge in Peter's day is a buzzword. And so he writes about a knowledge that is not just head knowledge, it's heart knowledge that confirms head knowledge. Can I say it this way? In 2024, you need to, go, you need to know God twice. You need to know God twice. You need to know him in your head, and you need to know him in your heart. You actually have to have a personal experience with God. So knowledge into self-control, self-control into steadfastness, steadfastness into godliness, which we said is God-likeness, and then God-likeness into brotherly affection, into love. Now you notice, he says brotherly affection, and then he says love, as if there's a difference, and there is. See, brotherly affection has to do with the people in the body of Christ. It has to do with the people that you run into on a weekly basis. It has to do with the people, can I say it this way, that are easy to love. A love, on the other hand, has to go beyond the people you're regularly in contact with. It has to go beyond the people you like. Love must touch your enemies. For you must love those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. Love has to touch your enemies enemies. Now, we're almost done. Verse 8, he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, Errol, you can come up wherever you're at. He says, verse 8, if these qualities are yours, now watch this, and are increasing. Oh, that's interesting. It's not just enough to have love. You actually have to grow in it. It's not enough just to have self-control. You have to grow in it. It's not enough to have knowledge. You have to grow in it. And so the question isn't, hey, do you have love? The question is, have you grown in love? 
The question isn't, do I have faith? The question is, have you grown in faith? Are you believing God for greater and bigger things today than you were before? It's not just, do I have self-control? It's, are you growing in self-control? Are you listening to the convictions of the Holy Spirit, or are you ignoring them so they become dull and more dull over time? If these qualities are yours and our are increasing, you know what that means? That means he's saying, he's saying this, he's saying this. True Christians don't stop growing. True Christians do not stop growing. Peter is at the end of his life. He is going to die and he is saying, hey, listen, we cannot stop growing. We have to continue. We have to strive. We have to press on. We have to increase. He says that they may keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus. Whoa. This means that there are Christians that are ineffective and unfruitful. If he is saying, hey, do this so you're not ineffective and unfruitful, that means there are Christians that are ineffective and unfruitful. Meaning they're not doing anything to add to the kingdom of God. They're not doing anything to further God's agenda. They're not doing anything to confirm their calling and their election. They're not doing anything. They simply observe. You just exist. And he's saying, no, 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 these have to be yours and increasing so that you're not ineffective and you're not unfruitful. We come to spaces and places like this where we worship God and then we leave the same. And I wonder, and I wonder why. And I wonder if that's an indication, church, that if we come to spaces and places like this and we are singing and lifting our hands high and we are even speaking in tongues, but we leave not looking like Jesus, I wonder if your worship is working. Because I would argue it's not. I would argue you're wasting your worship. For when you come into a space like this, where you exalt God, and you see him high and lifted up, are you not to be the one who comes under subjection? Are you not to be the one who comes into alignment and you become more obedient than you were when you first entered, when you exalt him? Is that not supposed to usher us into a life of submission? And yet what happens is we come to spaces and places like this and the person we're thinking most about while singing about Jesus is ourselves. And we leave more stubborn than submissive. Because we exalt ourselves and not him. The point of worship is that you change because you have seen his nature. You, like John, say, I must decrease so that you may increase. That's the point. That's the point. You don't come into spaces and places like this so that you have principles to walk out of here with. Principles are great, but it's the power and the presence of Jesus that transforms lives. You, you want to take notes? That's great. You want to tweet things? That's great. You want to put stuff on your Instagram to think, hey, I had this clever thought in church? That's great. But do you know the one that this whole thing is about? The one the Bible calls the treasure of all nations. Do you know him? Or has he become an afterthought, church? Does he serve your agenda, your motives, your goals for this year? There's this moment where Jesus takes three of his disciples onto a mountain. And and Jesus is transformed. And they see his glory. The only problem is there are two other individuals. Moses and Elijah. And Peter says, hey, this is an incredible space. Let's set up tents. I can build one for you. I can build one for Elijah. I can bring one for Moses. And the Bible says that the heavens open up and God speaks. And the person that God highlights is not Elijah and it's not Moses. It is Jesus. This is my beloved son. 
And the Bible says that they are so shaken with fear, they fall to the ground. And when they get up, they see no one but Jesus. They see no one but Jesus. Hear my voice, church. They see no one but Jesus. And God would ask you a question. Not even at the beginning of the year, at the end of this year, God will ask you a question. Have you seen my son? Have you seen my son? Yeah, you've grown in your education. Yeah, you've got a second income. Yeah, you're building your business. Yeah, you're driving two cars now. Yeah, you've got the house. You've got the family. You got married. You're living great. Yeah, you retired. It's the dream. But have you seen my son? Have you seen his worth? Have you seen his value? Have you seen the majestic one whose eyes burn like fire? Have you seen my son? Have you seen Jesus? Now, why is that so important, church? Look at verse nine, look at verse nine, look at verse nine. This is why it's so important to see Jesus. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. When you're not growing in Christ, the Bible says you have forgotten what he has done for you. You have forgotten that he has cleansed you. You have forgotten that he shed his blood for you. You have forgotten what he did on Calvary. Our hearts have this dangerous tendency of forgetting. And so you must keep Jesus before you, church. Ever present before you so that you do not forget who he is and all that he's done for you. I'm tired of hearing people tell me about how they used to serve God, what they used to know about God. I'm tired of them telling me how they used to do things for God. What are you doing today? What are you doing today? I can tell you of people who will boast about the worship bands they used to be a part of. What are you doing for him today? Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten what his blood did? And so he says, therefore confirm your calling and your election. How are we doing? How are we doing? How are we doing? I got three minutes. We're going to end. So how? How do I confirm God's choice of me? How do you confirm God's choice of you? If I break... Peter's words down into three words and sections. This is how you do it. You confirm through access. His power has granted us all things. You need access to him. You confirm through effort. Make every effort to supplement your faith. Make every effort to confirm your calling. And lastly, you confirm it through increase. Are you growing? Now watch this, watch this, watch this. These three things Access, effort, and increase must be surrounded with faith and love. You notice faith and love are the bookends to the things that he lists. And that's not a coincidence because the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hello? The Bible says this. In, in 1 John, the Bible says, no one has seen God, but if you love, God will live in you. What does that mean? Here's what this means. Faith pleases God and the love reveals God. Faith pleases God and the love reveals God. Faith is an invitation for God to do his work and love is a demonstration that God is at work. Did you hear what I said? Faith pleases God. Love reveals God. If you want to invite God into your life, for him to work in your life, you need faith. If you want God to demonstrate through your life who he is, you need love. Now, Peter is writing this at the end of his life. And I began to think about Peter's growth. Because Peter had to grow. 
The Peter writing this letter is not the same Peter we read about in the Gospels because he has grown through the day-to-day journey of following Jesus. When we first find Peter, Peter is impulsive and outspoken. Peter has faith but no character. Peter can walk on water but he can't hold his tongue. Hello? So he has faith but no character. And then we see Peter even deny Jesus, but then he's restored. You remember that? Jesus restores Peter, and then what do we see after his restoration? We see him on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends, and he comes on to everyone, and everyone's speaking in tongues, and people are hearing the works of God in their own language. We see Peter rise in leadership and begin to preach about the Jesus they crucified, and the Bible says that day 300 souls were added to the church. But then Peter grows. And Peter has other internal issues of racism and he has to come into reconciliation with Gentiles because he's so convinced that salvation is for the Jews. And the Jews and Gentiles should be segregated and so God has to wrestle him and rescue him to accept Gentiles. He's still growing. And then we find out through church history that Peter is martyred for his relationship with Jesus under the emperor Nero. He dies for this. That's the Peter writing this letter. This is old Peter. This is mature Peter. This is the Peter who's gone through some things and seen God pull him out. And what he would say to us, church, is do not forget what Christ has done for you. Do not that's the secret. If the secret to a, black, to a backslidden life is forgetting what Jesus has done for you, then the secret to a faithful life is remembering what Jesus has done for you. And so will you choose to remember? Will you choose to remember? My challenge for you is every day, even out loud, so you hear yourself. Tell yourself what Christ has done for you so that you do not forget. That you do not forget. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, I thank you that you are here and your presence is in our midst. Just as every head is bowed and eyes closed, I want to make sure. Maybe there are some of you here who are wrestling and you have not crossed the line of faith. You have not trusted Jesus for the salvation of your life. And you have not received the free gift of eternal life. You don't know what it means to know him, to walk with him, and to live life through him. And if that's you, whether in this room or watching online, and you're saying, I want to cross that line of faith today, I want to invite you to say a simple prayer just as every head is bowed and eyes closed. This is between you and God. You have so much more to talk about, but this is where it starts. If that's you, would you just say to God, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender. I receive you for who you are. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer, just as every head is bowed, I want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer, would you just raise up your hand? I want to pray for you very quickly. If that's you, I see your hand, sir. I see your hand, ma'am. I see your hands. Don't be shy. This is a moment between you and God. I see your hand. Father, I thank you for these hands. And more importantly, I thank you for these hearts. I thank you that they have received your life and now they are set on a trajectory towards eternal life and that is through your son Jesus Lord come and invade their life invade their space invade their imagination let them never remain the same heal every wound heal every area of rejection bring healing to the spaces they need healing in right now in the name of Jesus And God, for the rest of us, 
May we never forget. May we be ever grateful because of what you have done for us. Lord, we want to take a moment even in worship to express our gratitude, to say thank you, to say that we love you and that we worship you. In Jesus' name. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.